This show is produced by the Harwood Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Kevin Harris. We love making this show available to you free of charge. If you'd like to help us keep it that way, you can make a contribution to our Karma Jar or become a show sponsor. If you'd like more information, visit our website. Hey everybody, we're getting ready for the show now. In just a couple of minutes here, Austin Willisey is going to be singing into this mic. And come over here, let me show you what's going on. I'm, this is my guitar bunch of stuff that I'm gonna be doing for the show. And if you'll notice, this is not a guitar, it's an actual banjo. But don't worry, I've got a set of overalls and I'm gonna black out one of my teeth, so we're good. So Austin, welcome to Live from Basics. Thanks for having me, it's really good to be here. Now I've heard a nasty rumor that you are a Midwesterner. I was born in DC, but I didn't, didn't live there for very long. I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio called Shaker Heights. What was that like growing up? Uh, sometimes it was very cold. No, it was great. Um, uh, my parents uh, moved there because it had a really good public school system. They wanted my brother and I to get a good education. They wanted us to go to public school. Um, and you know, we had a yard where we could play baseball and a hoop where we could play basketball, and there were sports teams and all of that. You know, a great recreation board. So I had a really good good experience. I didn't have like a tortured childhood or anything. Oh man, I know. When did you get into music and all that? I started playing recorder. <laughs> Super sexy, I know. Uh, when I was about five. And my dad and I actually played some recorder duets. He was really supporting mm. that part mm. of uh, my musical development. Mm. Um, and then uh, probably two years later, maybe three, I played piano for as short as I could manage, which was probably four years, four or five. Um, I loved the piano, mm -hmm. but I did not love the songs that I was forced to play on the piano. Uh, yes. And consequently, I did not want to practice the songs that I was to play on the piano. Mm -hmm. So I kind of didn't. Um, but I, I started playing, I played clarinet in fourth grade, then saxophone, fifth through ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Then I quit everything. Mm -hmm. And then the summer before, or the spring before my senior year of high school, um, I was studying for an AP exam. And I was humming along with a song on MTV while I was checking a problem set for History AP. And this girl that I had a huge crush on um, walked through the room and she says, oh, were you just singing? And I was like, no. She said, were you humming? I said, yeah. She said, you have a high voice. You have to join the choir. You're a tenor. And I said, uh, no. She said, you know, it's going to be really, really great. We're going to go to Myrtle Beach for, for spring break. And, you know, Sarah Knowlton is going to be the vice president. I'm going to be the president of the choir. And, you know, come on, you know, please join the choir. I was mm. like, okay. <laughs> so she worked the hair flip. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that I had to audition for the choir. But I auditioned. I got into the choir. Then sang in a octet that was doing a barbershop a cappella song. Mm -hmm. um, and was totally blown away by that. So mm -hmm. when I went to college, sang a cappella. Then got invited to be part of rock bands. Really enjoyed that. Then started a rock band. Then started playing bass. And then started playing guitar to mm -hmm. write songs. Mm -hmm. So, Wow. So the recorder just, it's a good thing it wasn't the Babe Magnet. Oh, no, I were... still, it's a Babe Magnet now. Oh, it is. 
No, I, I would not have. <laughs> <laughs> so you, when you were sort of during your formative years, what were you listening to? I was listening to a lot of Top 40, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Midwest, um, we had Casey Kasem or whatever. Um, uh, America, coast to coast. Uh, so it was a mix of everything, you know. Um, and my parents listened to a lot of blues, so I, I was definitely steeped in that. They were listening to a lot of blues and Stevie Wonder and Bill Withers and Earth, Wind and Fire. Right. Um, and I was getting uh, Top 40 um, from the radio. Um, and then I was listening to, um, you know, sort of the black radio stations too. So it was great because I heard a lot of different music that I liked. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it all influenced me. When did the writing part of things come mm -hmm. up? The, the writing part began when I was about to go to college. Um, I had dated a, a girl for about a year and a half. We were very much in love and uh, had decided to break up. And I wrote her a song. Um, just sort of expressing my uh, feelings and how I was going to miss her and all that. Um, so that was the that was what drove me to write for the very first time. Mm -hmm. um, then in college, uh, my sophomore year, um, I connected with a guy uh, named uh, Judd who played piano really really well and had been writing a bunch of songs. And uh, he said, "Hey, we should write something." I was like, "Okay." So we went and wrote a song, and it was great. And it was for my girlfriend, and she totally loved it. And I wrote another couple of songs for her with him, um, and then just stopped. <laughs> Didn't write anything for probably two years, and then I started playing bass, and uh, had decided, had realized that at least the way that it worked in college was if I was only the singer in a band, mm -hmm. I didn't get to shape the repertoire very much, mm -hmm. even if I had put the band together, because mm -hmm. the players could just be like, oh, okay, we're gonna learn this, and then mm -hmm. they'd come to, her, okay, sing this. Yeah, and I said that's not cool. Yeah. Um, so I said, I'm going to learn to play something so that I can sort of, you know. Direct beat. a little exactly. more. Exactly. Yeah. So I learned bass um, and started playing bass a bit and also started writing because once I was using my hands and, you know, sort of getting that sort of fluidity and sort of getting into the meditative aspects of playing something, all of these melodies and things were mm -hmm. coming to me. And then the melodies were taking my hands to someplace else. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay, wait a second. So I started writing a lot of songs on bass. And then I moved out to the West Coast um, to pursue music. I started playing guitar um, because I wanted to have, have the, the opportunity to more easily bring in different sort of chordal elements mm -hmm. um, and different, different rhythmic patterns. You know, the te I mean, you know, finger plucking, uh, finger picking, flat picking, all that. Yeah. Um, to really sort of diversify what I was able to do if I was just playing something by myself because it, it all based upon all those influences that we were talking about before, they lead me in a bunch of different directions. Something that's plucked is very different than something that's picked, which is very different than something that's right, for me. Right, right. So when you first got into the writing thing, um, was there something that sort of informed you about, okay, what shape songs should be in, verse, chorus, bridge, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff? Yeah, the thing that had, had shaped that for me is that um, I had been arranging a cappella music. Yeah. So I had been arranging pop songs, blues songs, uh, jazz standards for the group that I was in, the Dartmouth Airs. Uh, and so I had to label the sections. This is what you guys do during what I had found out was called the verse. Mm -hmm. This is what you do and what's the chorus mm -hmm. or the refrain. And this is the thing that only happens once, it's the bridge. And because a lot of the songs that I write have a transition, which mm -hmm. is something that I call it because uh, I didn't know what else to call it, but it's a transition, a segue from the, the verse to the chorus. I mm -hmm. just call it a transition. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it was informed both by the pop stuff that I was listening to growing right. up the, and you know, the Stevie Wonder stuff. I mean, all the Motown music has, you know, is formulaic in right. that way. Um, and also by the arranging uh, that I had been doing because I, I knew that things had sec sections and needed for interest's sake um, to evolve mm -hmm. in some way. Right. And maybe it's rhythmic evolution, or maybe it's chordal, right. maybe the melody right. um, moves up you know, or, or changes timbre or texture, but that was where that came from for me. This first tune that we're gonna do, yeah. um, uh, Crazy, is really cool. I, I really, the first time I heard it, uh, when you sent it to me to listen to, um, the finger picking stuff on it was really cool. I thought, this is gonna be really nice. So tell me where this song came from. I wrote, uh, I wrote Crazy when I was in Germany on tour with the House Jacks. Mm -hmm. um, 
I had been hearing something like it in my head for a little while, but it was a really, really full tour, and we didn't have an off day for the first like two weeks of the tour. Um, the one off day that we did have was a Monday, and of course, my body picked that day to be sick. Uh, I spent the next day actually at the hotel room while the other guys went out and had a great time, and I ended up writing this song. Lyrically and emotionally, the, the, what drove it um, was the desire to really be seen mm -hmm. and to be really understood and loved for, for who I am um, as opposed to a projection. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in relationships, a lot of times people can see one thing or two things that they really, really love about somebody and then create an illusion about the right. other things and sort of right. just fill in the picture with whatever the colors they, that they want to use mm -hmm. and not see the person clearly mm -hmm. and, and learn to love those parts or realize perhaps that that's not the right person for them. And so this song is about really being seen that way, you know, for all of the colors that are in the picture that I am.
every smile, every minute, every mile away. I want to be crazy. So what is life like today for you? Uh, today life is very full, mm -hmm. um, full of good things. Um, I have lots of opportunities to travel and make music. Um, some of them are uh, gigging um, nationally, uh, sorry, domestically and internationally. Um, and we and should talk about the house jacks a sure. little bit because you're a you know, yeah. dyed in the wool member sure. of them, right? Yeah, so tell me a little bit about them. Sure, the house jacks uh, is a five-man a cappella rock band. Um, we say that because we write our songs on instruments uh, and then arrange them to be sung with our five voices. Uh, so the textures uh, and the sound of what we do um, at a live show actually doesn't really sound anything like traditional a cappella. It sounds a lot more like a band. It does. Um, too. I've heard what you guys are doing. It's really uh, unbelievably cool. Thank you. So people will have to go check yeah, that out you. as well. It's really fun. So you, you're on tour with them yeah. frequently. Yeah, so we do a lot of shows all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also, uh, we, I mean, we've been, this past year we've been recording, and our album will actually be coming out next month. Mm. It'll be our seventh one called Level. Um, and that's been a lot of time. And to top it all off, you're going to be tying the knot. That's true. Probably not long after or before this comes out. So That's right. Congratulations in advance, Thank or you. pretending it's like right now, right now. So, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thanks. So that's, um, yeah, that's, that's full. That yes. is full. So how do you carve out time to write with all this busyness that you're doing right now? The way that I end up carving out time to write is basically whenever I can. <laughs> um, I have a phone, and you know, the iPhone has a really good voice memo feature on it. Mm -hmm. So anywhere that I have my guitar, I've pretty much always got my phone. Um, so if a song idea, melody idea, uh, riff, chord progression comes to me, I can document it. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way that, it, that songs usually start in a little bit or a piece for me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really important for me to capture it the way that it initially was. Yeah. Even if I end up changing it subsequently, the way that I remember it, even at, at two hours later, when I finally get to record it, is not the way I that it was, yeah. and so it lose that I somehow lose that initial spark of yeah. of uh, inspiration, and then I then the, a lot of times the song that seemed like it was going to be amazing peters out. Yeah. So I've learned and trained myself to really capture it in the moment, uh, and then you know I fly a lot, so I have layovers, um, so lots of times I'll I'll play guitar you know at the gate. Um, and sort of you know mumbling lyrics or melody ideas to myself mm -hmm. um, until I'm ready to sort of record those. Mm -hmm. um, so some, I mean, sometimes a song will start out as a finger picking pattern at SFO before my flight leaves, mm -hmm. and then I've got a you know an hour and a half layover in Denver, and then I've got a verse and a you know transition. Right. Um, and then when I hit the ground um, someplace else, and I get to the hotel room or I get to a you know a sound check at like the break before the show, then I can try and figure out where those things lead, and then by you know usually by the end of that night I'll have a verse transition chorus and. Um, a melody idea sort of working out. When I'm home, I just try and do that late at night when it's quiet. You know? Right. So what sort of topics inspire you to write a song? I think that 
the, the things that I usually write about are uh, love. <gasps> Shocker. Wow. I know. Let me write that. Yeah. Um, but also uh, ways of being seen mm -hmm. in a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the, the songs that I've written about where they're not happy relationship songs are about sort of the pain of being invisible to someone that I wanted to be seen to, mm -hmm. uh, seen by, I should say. I also am inspired to write a lot of things, just sort of social observations or critiques. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are a handful of those songs. You know, some of them are environmental, some of them are political or mm -hmm. systemic uh, things as well. And then some are things that uh, encourage, that are really mantras to me to remind me to remain open-hearted and to trust the voice inside that knows what I'm supposed to do, that I, that I feel um, also connect with people and give them the opportunity for that to be a mantra and a reminder for them too. Mm -hmm. So tell me about when the world looks away, because I think it has to do with... Exactly. Actually, that song I wrote in about 25 minutes. Verse, lyrics, everything. Like, the whole song. Um, and for whatever reason, I just start. I was actually in the studio with the House Jacks. We were recording a record called Unbroken, and we were on a break. And uh, I had my guitar there. I said, oh, I'm just going to go fiddle around on guitar, and just came up with this basic riff. And we had been thinking about the notion of heroism, and whether or not a hero is someone who says, I am going to go and save that person, I am going to go and do good, or if somebody can be an inadvertent hero. So if you trip over your own feet because you're texting and not paying attention to where you go, and then you, act, you sort of knock this woman out of the way of getting hit by a bus, are you still a hero? Right. And you kind of are, but because the, the end result is you've still saved this person but you kind of blundered into it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that made me start thinking about the choices that we make. And what, if nobody else was watching, would we do the right thing? Mm -hmm. Would I do the right thing? Mm -hmm. um, what would the world look like if everybody was doing what they knew was the right thing to do, regardless of who was watching what they were going to get paid for it? And mm -hmm. so that was the impetus for that song. You know, what if everybody knew the choice was up to you? Mm -hmm. Tell me what are we to do when the world looks away. That idea, you know, when it's just you. Are you guided by this or something else? I hear the future calling. No, the sky is falling.
So when you go in to record on your own stuff, I know the house jacks is, is a whole different yeah. experience for you, but when you are working on your own stuff, what form are the songs in when you take them to him? Okay. Um, I am a writer who, when I get ready to record, I've written the songs, so I don't go up saying, oh, yeah, I kind of have an idea, right. and this will take on the shape eventually, or whatever. So I, it's baked. Yeah, so yeah. the songs are baked uh, in... Every or almost every case, they're songs that I have performed live mm -hmm. um, at solo shows. Um, and so it's then a matter of recording it and starting to feel my way into what, what shape makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, uh, Crazy you know, has a verse transition chorus, verse transition chorus, bridge, then it's verse, transition, chorus, chorus, bridge. It ends on a bridge. Mm -hmm. Your bridges don't usually happen twice, but that felt like the best way to, to, to cap that, you know, the best place emotionally and musically to, to leave it. Mm -hmm. When the World Looks Away also actually ends on a bridge figure, though I'm not singing a bridge melody there. Mm -hmm. um, but what I always try and do in the studio um, is reimagine the way that a song needs to unfold because the way that something uh, impacts me live, which is a linear experience, mm -hmm. is very different than the way it will impact me if I'm going to repeatedly listen to something. Right. Which is where you get into the, oh, well, I was a little bit flat on that note live, but nobody cares. It was live. You're gone. If you, if you, it's, it happened in the past, but if you're listening to somebody and it's obvious that they're flat on a recording, it's like, wow, couldn't they afford to... Yeah. Like, I've got Fix an auto-tune yeah. app for my iPhone. Couldn't they fix that? You know? Um, and so the same thing is true for the way that I approach uh, songs in the studio. Um, so sometimes things that really work well, uh, if I am performing the song with just me and a guitar, um, just, just voice and guitar, um, to keep that energy going and to keep the connection with the audience and keep the audience engaged, is very different in places than the way that the arrangement needs to have space mm -hmm. and breaks between the vocal so that the, the, the listener has a chance to digest um, the information, you know, the lyrical information or the melodic information that they're receiving. So tell me about, you have a, a little catalog going mm -hmm. already now. You have, uh, what, three albums? I have three solo CDs and an EP. Cool. And then you got another one that's just... Another one in the works, yeah. Uh, it's getting close okay. and so sounding really, really good. Where can people get a hold of this stuff? Okay. Uh, I have, I, well, I'm available on Amazon. Uh, I'm also available on iTunes, uh, CD Baby. Uh, and you can go to austinwillisey.com um, you know, and click through, and the links will take you to where you can get that music uh, for those three CDs. Cool. So we have people watching us all over the planet you now. So, and I know you've been all over the world <laughs> doing stuff with touring and everything else. So if you had to you know, talk to somebody that was getting started in writing and performing and all that kind of stuff, what kind of sage advice would you give them? To really know who you're writing for. If you are writing for yourself, if you are writing a song because you are moved to express something and you will not rest until it is expressed, then you know and you alone know when it is done because you will have that feeling of peace, that feeling of, of truth spoken. Right. Um, if you are trying to connect with an audience, then you have to open yourself up to receiving feedback about 
how what you're saying lyrically is landing, about how what you're singing is landing, about how what you're playing is landing with the people that you're trying to communicate with. In my opinion, music is only about expression and communication. Um, now, sometimes it's expressing joy. Sometimes it's expressing pain. Sometimes it's expressing sadness. Uh, sometimes it's expressing the desire to move a body. You know, and sometimes it's to open a heart and open a mind. These, but these are all communication. And the whole point of using, for me, of, for me, of using words and music is that it is to express things that cannot be expressed by one thing alone. I can't just say it and have it land the way that it, that it should land. And I can't just play it on a guitar and have you get it either. So trying to keep these elements in balance is the most important thing that I think any songwriter can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to know who you're trying to communicate with. If I'm trying to, sp to communicate with you effectively and I speak French and you don't, we're going to have to figure out another way to get it done or else it's not going to happen. Right. And sometimes songwriters are writing songs that feel like French to an audience that doesn't, that's not fluent. Mm -hmm. And so trying to increase their own fluency with their audience, whoever their audience is, is I think an ongoing process. At the same time, that has to be counterbalanced with what feels true. Right. Uh, and it has to be rooted in the songwriter's truth because the audience will smell it immediately yeah. if you're going up there and you're singing about stuff that you don't connect with, if you don't believe it, you haven't experienced it. So this kind of leads me to this, the last tune that we're going to do here. And um, uh, I'm so glad I found you. Is, um, uh, it was, I, I was both um, delighted and slightly terrified on this song when I first got a hold of it because I realized... It's got a banjo on it, which means, uh, and my banjo's sitting there hanging on the wall just going, hello, you know, you haven't played me in a thousand years. So, so tell me where this tune came from. It's a happy love song. Yeah, it is. It's just a happy love song. It's about being in love um, and being happy to communicate that to a person I'm in love with um, and say thanks. And then also um, chronicle... Uh, well, I guess highlight the difference between the relationship uh, that I'm in and some some relationships in the past that that were great, but were but there are ebbs and flows, and that some of the some of the the, the points in, in past relationships um, did not leave me where I wanted to be, um, and so the song sort of starts out in that place, sort of uh, reflecting uh, upon uh, the past mm -hmm. and then embracing the present fully. Love this tune. Well, Love thanks. this tune. It's really fun to play. One, two, one, two, three, four. I was broken, trying to call it.
understand the way I feel Cause I hear you fights and runs away And if to find another day But I'm with you And all the way my philosophy used to be The friends that I collected Well, that's our show for today. We'd like to thank Austin for coming over and playing some great tunes with us. If you'd like to get more information about Austin and how to get a hold of his great music, go to our website and go to the Live From Basics show page, and we'll have all that information there for you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.